Mistress of the Kamaloka by Peter Wirth, a pseudonym of Rog Phillips. First published in Mystic, number 4, May 1954. The woman parked her station wagon at the curb and bustled out, her shopping list clutched determinedly. Her daughter, 12, and son, 9, leaped out the other side of the car with whoops of attacking Indians. The woman started across the street to begin her shopping, then paused in surprise. Her startled eyes studied the small shop next to the drugstore. It was a jewelry store, and not a pretentious one. The faded sign above the show window said simply, Watchmaker. The window was dusty, the display inside equally dusty, with a few pieces of hollow wear obviously new, but also quite obviously tarnished from long exposure. Slowly, she approached the window and looked in. There was a clean circle where some piece had been recently removed, exposing the dust-free area where it had sat. She looked beyond the display to the low railing designed to keep customers from reaching the window display. Beyond the railing was a profile of a bent head and view of a watch repairman working at this trade, magnifying glass cupped over his eye. At his back was a board upon which hung dozens of wristwatches and several pocket watches. Her attention returned to the watchmaker. His hair combed straight back was glossy black. His forehead was white and smooth and receded into a scalp line that was deeply veed. She blinked her eyes and looked aside uncertainly, at the drugstore to the right of her, then to the supermarket to the left. She looked again at the watchmakers. The man inside was a stranger, but that was to be expected because the watchmaker's shop had not been here at all yesterday. Yesterday, the drugstore and the supermarket had been next to each other, their walls touching. Now, it was as though some hand had pushed them apart far enough to slip this old shop in between them. In sudden decision, she returned to the station wagon on the pretense she had forgotten something. When she turned around again, she studied the drugstore and supermarket. They seemed slightly narrower, as if squeezed to accommodate the watchmaker shop. She lifted her shopping list and looked at it. There, the last item on the list was get watch, of course. She shook her head dazedly. What kind of a trick had her mind been playing on her? Imagine, thinking the watchmakers hadn't been there yesterday when she had left her watch there last week to be fixed. She crossed the street again and marched into the shop. Is my watch ready yet, Mr. Altshuler? She said. I really miss it so. And as the watchmaker turned to search the board for it, she thought, imagine. She jerked back to her surroundings with a mental loss of bearings. Mr. Altshuler was taking off her wristwatch. I forgot to wind it, he explained. Of course, he had taken it from the rack and put it on her wrist. Now he was taking it off again to wind it. What was the matter with her? She remembered suddenly that she had kept looking at her watch all the way in from the farm. Or had she? Suddenly she wasn't sure, and of course she couldn't have, because her watch had been here all the time being repaired. Mr. Altshuler had opened the back of the case and was doing something to the insides with incredibly small instruments. Hmm, he said. I'm glad I decided to check inside again. This will only take a minute. She watched him. He opened a drawer in his workbench and took a very small metal object from a box that contained what seemed to be hundreds. With fine tweezers, he inserted it somewhere in the fine gear wheels. He put the works back in the case and snapped it shut. He put the watch back on her wrist. How much is it, she asked. Mr. Altshuler looked down at the counter. There were two cards there, one with a string on it and the other with a perforated edge. On both were written $2.75 in pencil. I remember now, she said. She paid the bill and hurried out to begin her shopping at the supermarket. She had to chuckle. It had been the funniest feeling. As she entered the supermarket, another woman paused in front of the watchmakers then went in. When she came out and went into the drugstore, a man paused before the watchmaker's window, frowning as though he was trying to remember something. Hi, Sonia. The auburn-haired girl glanced up from her typewriter, her frown of concentration replaced abruptly by animated friendliness. Hi yourself, Carl, she said. How's the writing business going? So-so, Carl Vance shrugged. Just raked in 50,000 bucks from movie sale of a bestseller of mine under a pen name you never heard of. He polished his fingernails carefully on his coat lapel. 
been shopping around today for a new car. It's a toss-up between a Cadillac and a New Yorker right now, depending on which will give me the color scheme I want. By the way, could you loan me 10 until the bank opens tomorrow so I can cash my check? Why sure, Carl, Sonia said, reaching for her purse. The next instant, she had discovered the twinkle in his eye. You dog, she gasped. Sometime you'll need money, and I'll think you're joking. I do need it, Carl said, if I invite you to have dinner with me tonight. Sorry, Carl. Your husband again? Carl groaned. Uh-huh, Sonia said. It was a standard joke between them, and she didn't have a husband. She liked Carl tremendously, but there was a tacit understanding between them that dating would lead to emotional complications neither of them wanted. Carl sighed deeply. Is his lordship in? He said. I have something that might intrigue him. Did me. I'll see, Sonia said. What is it? A new deal in Christmas cards. You buy a set of 24 for only 98 cents, and you get a new steam iron, a rebuilt vacuum cleaner, and a 30-inch TV set without additional payment. No kidding, Sonia said, her hand arrested just before the intercom switched to the inner office. How do they do it? Well, you see, Carl said. In order to become eligible for the special offer on Christmas cards, you have to buy a new Cadillac. I get it, Sonia said. You want to talk Craig into buying a Cadillac so you can borrow it. Okay, and if you manage it, I'll let you take me riding in the country. She pushed the switch. A salesman from the Cadillac people is here to see you about your new car, Mr. Barnes, she said sweetly. Okay, the loudspeaker said. Tell Carl to bring the letter in. How did he know, Carl said. Have you ever come up without something from your fan mail? Sonia murmured. She followed Carl through the door marked private. Craig Barnes did not give the impression of being impressive, even when he stood up to his full six feet, four inches of broad-shouldered height. He merely made the office seem small. This was a quality that Carl Vance had never quite gotten used to. It carried over into Craig Barnes' personality. You found yourself listening to his every word, wanting to do what he suggested, wanting to find some way of doing him a favor. If you wanted to be his friend, his enemies, they had a habit of underestimating him far too much. He often complained of this, claiming it didn't give him a chance to feel he came out on top by ability, but rather by lack of common sense on the part of his enemies. And he would add sadly, there's a difference, you know. Craig Barnes shook hands with Carl Vance, eyeing the letter protruding from Carl's pocket. Carl grinned and said, okay, horsey, here's your lump of sugar. He handed the letter to Craig, adding, of course, it's really nothing. I'd use it to write a story if I could think of some way to handle it. It might come to me eventually. Some woman that suffered quite a common type of delusion. She saw a building that had always been where it was and had a peculiar feeling that it hadn't been there the day before. It's... His voice drifted into silence as he realized Craig wasn't listening. His bright blue eyes were jumping from phrase to phrase of the letter. A Mrs. Theona Krupp, he said when he finished the letter. In Mansfield, Montana, he went to a bookshelf and took down an atlas. In a moment, he had all the information it could give. Mansfield was in north-central Montana, population 850, a cattle and copper mine locality, elevation 4,300 feet, reached by a dead-end highway and a spur track of the Great Northern Railway. He glanced over the letter again, indifferently. Interesting, he conceded, but as you say, quite common. Let me know if she writes you again, Carl. How about having lunch with me and Sonia? Why not? Carl said lightly, grinning at Sonia. That's really what I came over for. The letter was just an excuse. Wait in the outer office with Sonia for a minute or two, Craig said. Got a couple of things to take care of. Only take a minute. He still held the letter from Theona Krupp in his hand. When Carl and Sonia closed the door, Craig went to his desk and sat down. He stared at the letter, frowning in concentration. Finally, he laid it flat on the desk and placed his fingertips on it, closing his eyes. Images built up in his mind's eye, a farm surrounded by rolling hill country, an enormous hay barn, a small but well-built house, and finally, the face of a woman. He was certain it must be Theona Krupp. There were two children, a boy and a girl, a husband, Theodore, who had few thoughts outside the business of his farm. 
Craig's forehead became dotted with perspiration from the intensity of his concentration. He knew he had gained contact with Fiona. Now he was trying, through that contact, to see the watchmaker's shop. He felt Fiona consciously become aware of his contact and its purpose and try to help him. Bit by bit, he made more positive the contact between them. Abruptly, he felt a searing pain flash into his mind. He sensed its short-circuiting neural paths. His body jerked convulsively as though in contact with a high-voltage power line. He found himself sprawled on the floor, his chair tipped over. In his mind, echoing and re-echoing was the memory of a woman's voice, agonized, repeating over and over, my watch, my watch, my watch. Carl Vance and Sonia Mills came bursting through the door. Sonia rushed to Craig with a low moan. Oh, my darling, are you all right? Carl stared closely at Craig and saw he was all right. Aha, uh -huh, he said. Now I see why I can't get anywhere with Sonia. She's in love with her boss. I am not, Sonia flared. He's hurt. I'm not hurt, Craig said, getting to his feet. But maybe Theona is. He looked dourly at the letter on his desk. Some terrible power. Carl Vance stared at the letter. He guessed what Craig had tried to do. He had himself experimented with telepathic contact by means of a letter from a person, but with no success. Sonia, Craig said in sudden decision, get me a reservation on the first plane for Billings, Montana. I'm going out there and see what's going on. Make it two reservations, Carl said. I'm going along. I'll make it three, Sonia said. Neither of you are going. Craig said with great firmness. It's too dangerous this time. Carl and Sonia exchanged a secret smile. Craig Barnes was the son of a female mystic. His mother had had great ability as a medium, fortune teller, and mind reader. His father had been a famous nuclear physicist. Other mystics dreamed dreams of the day when the realm of the supernatural would become integrated into legitimate scientific study. Craig's mother, Olga, had dreamed of a son who would combine her psychic powers with the intellect of a true scientist. When that son had been born, she had dedicated her life to developing to the fullest extent all the latent extrasensory powers with which she was firmly convinced all humans are born, though in varying degree. At the same time, she encouraged the attempts of her scientist husband to interest Craig in purely scientific studies. The results were all Olga had hoped for. By the time Craig reached college, he had equaled his mother in psychic development and in many ways had surpassed her. He might have turned his back on science, but Olga had carefully instilled within him her dream of wedding science and the occult. That dream caused him to throw himself into scientific study with equal zeal, with the result that by the time he obtained his PhD in physics, he was already a recognized physicist. His father died during his last year in college. His mother died when he was 25. He had had no contact with his father after his death. His mother remained only long enough to assure him she was all right. She returned two weeks later to let him know she had located his father in a school. After that, Craig was entirely alone. His great dream was to discover or invent some bridge between the astral and the material that would be independent of the human mind. The more he delved into the subject, the more impossible it seemed. But Craig was convinced that such a bridge must exist. He dedicated his life to finding it. There were three avenues of study. First, he might discover it himself through research. Consequently, he continued his scientific studies, gaining a reputation as an independent nuclear research scientist. Ostensibly, that was the sole function of his office. Second, there was the possibility that someone else might beat him to the discovery. So he kept abreast of the mystic field and in fairly close contact with writers in that field, such as Carl Vance. If even a whisper of such a discovery were made, he would be one of the first to hear of it. Third, some natural or supernatural phenomenon might be uncovered that would point toward the principle that would underlie such a bridge with the supernatural. This aspect of his search led him to investigate every unusual occurrence. Most valuable in this line were the writers like Carl, who received many letters from people on unusual occurrences. In return for these leads, he made reports to those writers which they could use in their writings. Most of such leads led to little or nothing. 
Some showed great promise and dwindled into nothing but the imagination of the writers of the letters. Some developed into genuine supernatural occurrences, but so far, none had pointed toward a concrete bridge to connect the occult to the physical sciences. None had shown the promise of this letter from Theona, nor had any begun with such display of danger. Power that had bridged a distance of 2,000 miles nearly to destroy Craig. He entertained no doubt of the intention of the wielder of that power. Fear greater than the human mind can bear had bit into him for a fraction of a second. Concentrated psychic power had seared into him with all the hate and inhumanity of Satan himself, and it had been directed through Theona Krupp or her watch. On the plane, as it spanned the distance from Chicago to Billings, he puzzled over the various aspects of the problem. Always his thoughts came back to one question. Why had this thing begun in Mansfield, Montana? Because it was off the traveled path and therefore less likely to be discovered or interfered with. Was it connected in any way with the many reports of flying saucers over Montana or the detailed though unverified reports of huge globular spaceships landing in northern Montana? There was another possibility that Craig had entertained from the first moment he read about Mansfield in the Atlas. Mansfield was a mining center. That meant that tunnels were being constantly extended, this way and that, deep underground. Had one of these mining tunnels broken through to something underground? It was a possibility that disturbed him. To encounter something new and as yet not powerful enough to defy control was one thing. To plunge into the midst of something already too powerful for the science of man to cope with would be entirely different. It was for that reason he wanted to investigate alone, but he had been overruled. However, he kept these thoughts to himself. Where's Billings? Carl Vance asked as the plane circled in for a landing. Craig and Sonia smiled. The landing field did seem to be alone in a mountain wilderness. They and two others were the only passengers in the airport bus. It encountered little traffic on its way to town. Eventually, it pulled up in front of a brick front with a modest sign announcing the Northern Hotel. Inside was a small lobby packed with overstuffed chairs, each occupied by someone who obviously intended to remain where he was indefinitely. The clerk, thin-chested and consumptive, eyed them suspiciously. Miss Mills is my secretary, Craig explained. By the way, where can I rent a car for a week or so? Why, uh, the clerk hesitated. A man rose from a nearby chair. You want to rent a car, mister? He said. I've got one I ain't using right now. You can have it for 50 bucks. That too much? That's what I expected to pay, Craig said. It's a Ford, kind of beat up, but with a good engine. It'll get you there. Come on outside, and I'll show it to you. My name's George Purdy. Fine, George, Craig said. Sonia, you go upstairs. Carl and I will meet you in half an hour. We'll eat, and then we can use the car to look over the town. He turned again to the man named Purdy. All right, George, let's see the car. George Purdy led the way, with Craig and Carl on either side. They went down a side street from the hotel. The Ford, a 1948 sedan, was parked at the curb. Here's the keys, he said, fishing them out of the pocket of his jacket. Fine, Craig said. I suppose you want the week's rental now. He took a thick billfold from his pocket and took out two twenties and a $10 bill and gave them to Purdy. Anytime you want to get in touch with me, Purdy said, I'm generally in the lobby. He stuck the money in his pocket and walked back toward the hotel. Craig stood watching him depart. What's the matter? Carl Vance said. Something wrong? I don't know, Craig said. It seems impossible. No one knew we were coming. I doubt that anyone here ever heard of us, and certainly they wouldn't know what we look like. Then what's eating you? Carl demanded. Nothing, Craig said, except that Purdy was too convenient. Look, Carl. That jolt I got in the office was deliberate on the part of someone very dangerous, someone able nearly to kill me over a distance of 2,000 miles as soon as he sensed my contact with Mrs. Krupp. Would it be too much for him to reason that I might catch an early plane for the nearest airport city and check into the hotel the airport bus goes to? You think Purdy is the big shot? No, I could be mistaken, but no. Carl Vance frowned. You think they might have a bomb in this Ford? I think we should take every precaution, Craig said. 
Purdy's just handing us the keys and walking away before we could get into the car might mean a bomb. Craig peered through the windows. Seeing no wires connected to the doors, he inserted the key and unlocked the door on the driver's side. Nothing happened. He looked down the street, his eyes settling on the sign of a hardware store. Wait here, Carl, he said. Five minutes later, he returned with a ball of heavy twine. He tied one end around the hood release handle under the dashboard and played out the ball until he was 10 feet away from the car. Get across the street, Carl, he cautioned. When Carl reached the opposite sidewalk, Craig pulled firmly on the string. They saw the hood pop up an inch. Craig waited another minute, then approached the car, winding the string back on the ball. Next, he stooped down and studied as much as he could see of the catch under the hood. I think it's safe to lift the hood, he said. He reached in and pushed back the catch. The hood went up. Carl came from across the street. He watched Craig exploring the motor. Finally, Craig grunted, nothing under here. One other place, under the dashboard. He left the hood up and went around to the side and started to get into the car. Wait a minute, Carl said. It might be possible to rig some pressure contact in the cushion so when you sit down, Craig straightened up slowly. You may have it, he said. Get on the other side and we'll lift the seat. Together, very cautiously, they coaxed the seat cushion up and slid it forward to look under it. Aha, Carl exclaimed. There were bright colored wires dangling from the underside of the cushion and leading to a small metal box. Carl reached in to yank at one of the wires. Don't touch it, Craig warned. The trigger mechanism may be the break kind instead of make. Disconnecting a wire would set it off, if that's the case. Inch by inch, they tilted the seat until they could see the triggering mechanism. While Carl held the seat cushion steady, Craig carefully worked the mechanism free. What'll we do with it? Carl asked. Craig didn't reply. He was studying the contact switch. Finally, he unhooked the wires. That should make it harmless, he said. Just the same. He found a screwdriver in the glove compartment and carefully dismantled the box. Finally, he held three sticks of dynamite in his hand. They meant business, Carl said. What do we do now? I'd suggest we get some other car. It's a cinch. We'll never see George Purdy again. Craig grinned. First, let's take this car to a garage and have them go over every square inch of it. Maybe they'll find more stuff. It's possible they figured we might find the bomb and planted other things. Carl glanced at his wristwatch. The half hour's up, he said. Sonia will be down in the lobby waiting for us. I'd forgotten about Sonia, Craig said. Come on, he broke into a fast trot back to the hotel. Sonia wasn't in the lobby. Craig barked at the clerk, get Miss Mills' room on the phone for me. The clerk shook his head. She went out, he said. The gentleman who rented you the car came in a few minutes after you left with him and told her over the phone to come right down that you wanted her to come out to the car. She came right down and went out with him. Do you know that man? Craig said. Does he live here in the hotel? The clerk shook his head. I never saw him before this morning. He came in about nine this morning and sat down as though he were waiting for someone. I noticed that he studied the passengers from the airport bus every time it came here. I guessed he was expecting someone but wasn't sure what the person looked like. Craig and Carl ran out into the street knowing as they did that it was too late. George Purdy had almost half an hour to get away with Sonia. On the sidewalk, Carl groaned. We don't know what kind of a car he used or where he went. How will we ever find her? Let's hope that Ford can go fast, Craig said. Our only hope is to catch up with them. They won't kill her here in Billings. They will take her to Mansfield or near there. They ran the block to the car. What'll we do with this dynamite? Carl said as they climbed in. Put it in the back seat, Carl. We may find a use for it, and we'll just have to take the chance. There's nothing else wrong with this car. Every second counts. Craig jammed on the starter button. The motor roared to life. He shot away from the curb, broke the speed limit going through town. He almost overshot the turnoff toward Mansfield, but made it on two wheels. Seconds later, they were in open country, the speedometer hovering around 80. We have one chance, Craig said. Purdy may have realized we didn't fall for the bomb trap. If he knows we aren't dead, he may keep Sonia alive as a hostage. They passed several cars. Craig glanced at each, but didn't slow down. 
How are we going to know if we pass a car that has Sonia in it? Carl Vance asked. We can only hope we do, Craig Barnes said. The cars we just passed left Billings only a couple of minutes ago. If they have Sonia in a car and are taking her to Mansfield or near it, they would have started at least 15 minutes before we did and gone fairly fast. That means we will probably be more than halfway there before we catch up with them. And George Purdy, besides being easy to spot if he's the driver of that car, would recognize this car and perhaps do something to give himself away. We have the psychological advantage. I hope they haven't killed her, Carl said, his agony of anxiety showing on his face. The instant they do, I'll know, Craig said harshly, and God help them. Carl looked sharply at Craig as Craig's voice broke and looked away again, embarrassed at seeing such raw emotion on a face that was ordinarily reserved and friendly. They were silent as the car hurtled on, eating up the miles. Suddenly, Craig braked the car almost to a stop and turned off the highway into one of the many side roads. He drove in until the highway could no longer be seen. Stay where you are, he grunted, opening the door and getting out. Carl saw him run back toward the road. A few minutes later, he came back and got behind the wheel. They'll think we're ahead now, he grunted as he turned the car and went back to the highway. As the car turned onto the pavement and picked up speed, he explained, I saw a car off on a side road. I thought it might be them. I guess their strategy. Wait until I whiz by, then follow me. But now I know the car. It's a 52 Buick. I touched Sonia's mind for an instant. They don't intend to kill her. They're going to take her to their headquarters. Then we'll follow them there? Carl asked. We'll try to. I didn't dare contact her longer than an instant. We're onto something so dangerous that, frankly, Carl, we may not come out of this alive. We're dealing with the Kama Loka. Everything points to it, and I don't see how it's possible unless there is something behind it so terrible that I am afraid. The Kama Loka, Carl said. But isn't that the realm of astral shells and thought forms, semi-material, but lacking in intelligence? It's the missing link, Craig said. I've thought it must be, but I couldn't see why. The Kama Rupa or astral shell that lives on for a while after death, then dissipates. Why is it necessary? Is it because pure spirit can't govern the physical except through a type of basic substance intermediary to physical and spiritual? I've missed that angle in my research. Someone else or something has found that key. It scares me. He became silent. Carl stared ahead, trying to digest what Craig had said. The miles passed swiftly. From time to time, they saw the tail of the 52 Buick ahead. It was going at a steady 85 miles an hour, all the highway would permit. The Ford gained on it on straightaways and fell back on curves where it had to slow down more because it was a lighter car. Tell me more of what you think on this Kama Loka business, Carl said finally. Why did you pick that term in particular? It's Sanskrit. I've always considered it synonymous with the astral. In a way, you might say the astral is included in the Kama Loka, Craig explained. The Kama Loka could also be called a plane of reality, just as the material universe is a plane of reality. They are both real in the physical sense. Atoms as we know them interact by means of their fields and emanations, which have interlocking action. That is the basis of chemistry. One part of the field of one atom is shaped so it can fit into a part of the field of another atom. That forms chemical union. Craig shot the car off the road and along the bank to get past slower moving cars going on both directions, then skidded back onto the highway without having slowed down. The way I picture the Kama Loka, he went on calmly, is as a field of similar atomic units, but much smaller. I think mesons are the atoms of this finer reality. They can synthesize with other mesons, but not with atoms, and vice versa. But when they are built up into large structures, they can act upon large structures of the atoms we know by means of their total field structure. Such a structure is the astral body of the living person. How it builds up, I don't know yet, but I think the soul has something to do with it. The soul is on still a different plane of reality, and I don't have the slightest inkling as to its basic nature, though I have plenty of theories. One thing seems that the soul can form shapes made of mesons and make them so solid that they pass for ordinary matter. And I don't believe the soul can operate on ordinary matter directly, 
but only through the Messen structures, or Kamaloka. Sometime maybe we can go into it in more detail. Carl frowned as he digested this information. How does all that fit into what we're running into, he asked. I wish I knew, Craig said. A jeweler's shop where no building can be, according to Theona's letter. Small things put into watches that make it dangerous, even to contact a person from 2,000 miles away without being seared by subatomic fires. It's those small things in the watches that I'm anxious to get at. I think they hold the key to this whole mystery. But getting one would probably be like getting an atom bomb without knowing how to keep it from blowing up. First things come first. We want to follow the car ahead and see where they take Sonia and rescue her if we can. Then I want to investigate that watchmaker's shop. A few seconds later, they rounded a curve and saw the town of Mansfield. It was in a valley, a few hundred houses, a grain storage warehouse, railroad tracks, stock pens by the tracks. The highway wound downward off the mountain pass they had gone through. The Buick was half a mile ahead of them, in sight part of the time. Craig had to concentrate on the road ahead. Carl watched for the Buick. Suddenly, he saw it turn off the highway. They aren't going into town, he said to Craig. Slow down after the next switchback. I think I can spot the road they turned off on. There was no missing it. Tracks of scorched rubber on the pavement marked the turn off plainly. They almost passed it themselves, Carl said. The dirt road wound among the giant pines for a few miles, then became narrower and went uphill gradually. Once they saw the Buick across a narrow valley, still going. I wonder if they saw us, Craig grunted. I'm beginning to think they intended us to follow them. You mean a trap, Carl said. If it is, what do we do? Walk into it, Craig said. We didn't come here to play safe. Yeah, sure, Carl said, swallowing. Craig grinned. Wish you were back at your typewriter, Carl? Oh, no, no, Carl said airily. Nothing I like better than to tangle with people who plant bombs in cars and kidnap women. Craig chuckled dryly and slowed down, wary eyes surveying every square inch of the scenery as it unfolded ahead of them. It had rained a day or so before. The tracks of the Buick were visible in the soft spots. Here, Craig said suddenly. The tracks turned onto a narrow pair of ruts going into the woods. Craig went past the turnoff for a few yards. At a stretch where the road was dry and hard, he turned into the grass and backed the ford into the concealment of a thicket. We'll go on from here on foot, he said. I doubt if that wagon trail they took goes very far. They followed the pair of ruts well to one side, going forward slowly and with extreme caution. Sometimes they had to creep closer to the road to make sure they were still paralleling it. Then they would retreat into the protection of the silent forest. It took them half an hour to go the quarter of a mile. Suddenly, Craig put his hand on Carl's shoulder. Look up there, he whispered. Carl looked where Craig pointed and saw the roof of a building through the trees. The roof went up the side of a steep hill for a hundred yards. That building is an ore processing plant, Craig said softly. The two men stole cautiously to the edge of the forest. The other mine buildings could be seen across the clearing. The Buick was parked in front of one of them. What'll we do? Carl whispered. They could have lookouts in those buildings who would spot us if we showed ourselves. Craig studied the silent mine buildings for several minutes. Suddenly he said, this is what I think best. You stay here and watch that Buick. We can't sneak in until after dark without being spotted. I'm going on into town and investigate. I'll be back by dark. One of us has to remain here to make sure if the Buick leaves that it doesn't take Sonia. Now listen, Craig made a noise like a scolding squirrel. When I come back, I'll make a sound like that as I come in. That way you'll know it's I. Okay, Carl said. When you come back, bring some sandwiches if you think of it. I'm hungry. Craig ran silently and swiftly back to the car. His eyes darted keenly around, studying the grass. There were faint signs that might be from several people approaching the car. No one was in sight, and no one was in the car as he approached silently and peered in through the windows. He hesitated, then got in, starting the motor quickly and backing out onto the road. He was ready to drop to the floor of the car, but no shots came. He frowned uneasily. Why had they let him go when they had him? Because they didn't know where Carl was? 
or were they so sure they had him that they could let him have his freedom a while longer? He shrugged off the feeling of uneasiness. It was possible that they were as afraid of him as he was of them. After all, he had reached across 2,000 miles to contact the mind of a woman he had never seen. They might be treating him with caution because of that, and to a certain extent they might be right in dealing cautiously with him. His lips settled into a grim line. He realized that perhaps his only hope lay in the powers behind this thing, underestimating him. They were swift and deadly. Getting him preoccupied with a bomb planted in a car while they kidnapped Sonia was evidence of real cunning, especially when they were only going on the surmise that someone would come to investigate, and they had no idea who or how many people it would be. He thought of Carl. The grim line of his mouth relaxed into a tight smile. In a way, he hoped they would capture Carl. Carl was a little telepathic. He could contact Carl much easier than he could Sonia. And if Carl and Sonia were together, it would make things less difficult. He reached the highway and turned toward Mansfield, less than a mile distant. The forest dwindled to small pines, then was replaced by wheat land that went up to the city limits. He slowed to 25 miles an hour and sent his mental probes toward Carl. He nodded his satisfaction. So far, Carl was safe. Carl was still watching the Buick and hadn't seen any movement from the mine buildings. Carl, of course, was not aware of having been contacted. Ordinarily, he might have sensed it, but right now he was too concerned about what might be happening to Sonia and too busy fighting the impulse to do something on his own to rescue her. Craig considered trying to contact Sonia, then decided against it. The memory of that searing explosion in his mind when he contacted Theona would not easily be forgotten. He had reached the city limits. His attention turned toward the buildings that lined the main street ahead of him. The short business district. He recalled what Theona had said in her letter about the shop of the watchmaker. It would be sandwiched in between the drugstore and the supermarket. But abruptly, he swerved into the curb, shut off the motor, and in a swift movement, slid out of the car on the sidewalk side. He was directly in front of a pool hall. He went inside without hesitating, walked swiftly but inconspicuously toward the back. As he hoped, there was an alley exit. He opened the door and stepped out into the alley. Not until then did he pause to question his actions. Without slowing down, he walked to the far end of the alley in the direction of the business district. On the side street, he went toward the main street, strolling at a lazy pace. When he reached the corner, he turned toward the business district but not before he had glanced the other way. In that brief glance, he saw the car he had just left. Parked alongside it in the street was a police car. Turning his back to the scene and continuing toward the business district, he slowly exhaled a sigh of relief. He had acted unquestioningly on what some people would call a hunch, but which he knew to be what many hunches are a telepathic alarm system in the brain which acts when someone has turned hostile attention on a person. By a margin of seconds, he had escaped the final trap set for him. He knew what it was now. The Ford had been reported stolen and a statewide alarm sent out for it. The police would have arrested him and locked him up as a suspected car thief. It might have taken days for him to clear himself in an out-of-the-way place like Mansfield. He still wasn't out of danger. Someone in the pool hall might have noticed him and might describe him to the police. He hastened his steps, not daring to look back lest the police get curious about him. A burning desire to see the shop of the watchmaker obsessed him. A block away, he saw the sign of the supermarket. Partly hidden by that sign was another for a drugstore. Fighting the impulse to break into a trot, he hurried along. He was almost at the entrance of the supermarket when the sound of a police siren exploded behind him. It was almost on top of him. Not daring to look in that direction, he went quickly into the supermarket. Had he seen the sign above the watchmakers that Theona had described? He was almost sure he had, as he pushed through the turnstile and hurried toward one of the half dozen aisles leading toward the back of the store. At the first cross aisle, he stepped behind a high stack of canned tomatoes on sale and risked a glance toward the front of the store. The police car was plainly visible outside, and two policemen were entering the store with drawn guns. 
Now, there was no question of whom they were after. For an instant, indecision held him. He could give up and try to tell them the truth. He almost decided that way. Then lights flashed on a gleaming wristband on one of the policemen. A wristwatch. Keeping low, he ran with long, silent strides toward the swinging doors at the rear that led into the storerooms. He made it just as he was seen. The doors swung closed on the loud shout. An open rear door invited him. He ran to it, pushed it open, then ducked back behind the concealment of a pile of cartons. He heard heavy footsteps. He saw a policeman rush out the door into the alley. More heavy steps sounded, slower. He saw the second policeman open the back door and look out, gun ready. A loud voice from the alley called, maybe he's still in there. Take a look around before you come out. From his concealment, Craig saw the cop look around him, his complexion turning slightly green. He turned back to the alley door and called out, he ain't in here. Maybe he ducked into the drugstore. I'll run back out front and hold him from that end. More loud footsteps than deep silence. Craig was alone, but with a policeman in the alley and one out front. The one in front was afraid, which meant he would probably shoot if he saw the prospects of danger threatening him. Craig groaned. To have been so close to the watchmakers, and yet so far! He waited, listening. There was nothing but silence. He began looking around him, considering ways of escape. The room was filled with orderly stacks of large cartons. His eyes dwelt on several large cartons of toilet paper against the wall nearest him. A plan formed. The rolls of paper would be good protection against bullets. He searched farther. There was a two-wheeled truck, and hanging from a nail on the wall by the alley door was a grocer's apron and a cap. They would be a fair temporary disguise. He tiptoed out from his concealment and peeked out a window into the alley. He could see no one. He tiptoed to the door to the front and peeked through the crack. Customers and clerks were all near the front, huddled together for protection and courage. Beyond them, outside on the sidewalk beside the police car, was one of the cops, looking very brave with his drawn gun. A grin flicked over Craig's worried expression. It vanished as he noticed something about the huddled customers and clerks. On the left wrist of each of them was a watch, its metal band gleaming brightly as though recently polished. He looked down at his own wristwatch. It gave him a start to see it. Then he remembered that he hadn't visited the watchmaker. Not yet. He tiptoed back and carefully loaded several cartons of toilet paper onto the hand truck. Next, he put on the canvas apron and the cap. There was only a chance that this clumsy ruse would fool the cop in the alley, but it was his only chance. Undoubtedly, the one out front had used the police car radio to call for reinforcements. Before long, the place would be swarming with city and state police. Now he boldly pushed the hand truck to the alley door and let it open the door and roll out. No shots sounded, so he continued on out, apparently unconcerned. No one was in sight. He turned the hand truck toward the drugstore. He hoped there might be a back entrance to the watchmakers, but the only door besides that of the supermarket was the one entering the drugstore. He paused briefly there, then went on. Entering the drugstore would be no answer to his present problem. He had to get away. A doorway on the other side of the alley was open behind a loosely hanging screen door. He pushed his hand truck over beside it and looked in. The next instant, he had opened the screen door and pushed the truck inside. He frowned, it seemed too easy. Leaving the hand truck, he stole toward the archway leading to the front of the store. From the stock in the back, it had to be a men's clothing store. There were no customers. At first, Craig thought the store was empty. Then he saw the clerk, sitting with his feet propped up on a counter, to all appearances, asleep. Craig's eyes surveyed the store, then concentrated on the door to the street. It was propped open. There was nothing to stop him from escaping. Yet bells were dinning frantic alarm in his brain. His skin tingled with a sense of danger. The hair on his arms rose uncomfortably against the restraining confines of shirt sleeves. His gaze jerked back to the sleeping clerk. Had the clerk's eyes just closed? Craig had a fleeting impression that they had opened for the instant he was turned away. Craig kept his eyes on the clerk, watching the man's eyes. If he weren't asleep, he would soon give himself away. While he waited, little things clicked together in his mind. 
That cop, he hadn't acted like a man searching for a car thief. He had been afraid of what? And the way they had spotted him so surely, perhaps understandable in a small town where a stranger is conspicuous a block away. But why had the police sounded their siren and let him escape into the supermarket? They could have let their car drift into the curb and captured him easily enough at gunpoint. Why hadn't they? Had they wanted to make him seem a fugitive trying to escape? A suspect trying to escape could be killed without causing too much notice. The way things have built up, Craig thought, I could walk out that door and be mowed down by bullets, and a hundred witnesses would be willing to testify that I had been running from the law. So that was why alarm bells had been screaming in his head. Outside this shop were men watching for him to come out, and they would kill him. They intended to kill him. With him dead, Sonia could be killed, and her body dropped down some abandoned mine shaft. Carl could be caught and killed. After that, no one in the outside world would know that anything sinister was developing here in Mansfield. A town full of slaves. Craig's eyes fixed on the clerk's wristwatch gleaming from the overhead lights of the store. Suddenly, a gleaming wristwatch band seemed the most sinister thing in the world to him. A memory hit him with cold shock. He wanted one of those wristwatches. He wanted to look inside it and find that little thing that had been placed there by the watchmaker. And here was the ideal opportunity to get one. Sneak up on the clerk, knock him out perhaps, and slip off his watch. Inch by inch, he crept toward the clerk, ready to drop down out of sight at the first sign of movement from the clerk or out in the street. The clerk continued to sleep, and now Craig could hear the soft snoring sound of his breathing. He was a man in his early 40s, his nationality indeterminate. He might be Armenian or Russian or even French, thick-chested and long-armed, suggestive of a black-haired spider with a hawkish nose and two full lips, a type that gravitates towards small shops the world over. After what seemed an eternity, Craig stood over him. The regularity of the soft snoring didn't change. Craig doubled up his fist, then slowly relaxed his fingers. It would be a simple job to knock the clerk out if he awakened. With steady hands, Craig slipped his fingers under the expanding wristwatch band, then with infinite care slid the watch over the sleeping man's hand. Finally, he straightened with the watch in his hand. The clerk still slept, Craig looked closely at the watch now. It was almost identical with his own. In fact, they were the same make. He could slip his own watch on the sleeping clerk, and the man probably would never notice the substitution. It would really be a slick move, Craig decided. First, though, he'd better put the clerk's watch on. Otherwise, if someone barged into the store and he had to move fast, he might lose it. He extended his fingers to slip the watch over his hand and in the next instant, without time for thought, he flung the watch away from him. In a continuation of that movement, he lashed forward with his fist toward the sleeping clerk. There was a blur as his fist seemed to meet, then sink into solid flesh. Craig caught his balance and blinked at the space that had been occupied by the clerk's head. It was thin air. The man had vanished. The chair the man had sat in remained tipped on two legs for another instant, then tipped forward to the floor. The sound was loud in the silence. Dazed, Craig shook his head violently to clear his senses. He looked around the store, almost hoping to see the man lift his head above a counter. It would be so nice to believe the man had merely ducked his head and slipped away. The alarm bells in his mind, they were silent now. The danger was past. Craig looked toward the street door. If there had been any danger out there, he had no presentiment of it now. He looked back toward the now vacant chair. A chill crept along his spine. He knew now where the danger had lain. If he had put on that wristwatch, he would have become a slave of this being from hell that was able to vanish. An emotion of helplessness flooded over Craig. How could he hope to defeat such a being? He was only a child in development compared to this man or devil. It was hopeless to try to do anything. He looked at the empty chair again. A slow grin spread over his face. Twice in the last hour, he had defeated carefully laid plans of the, the watchmaker. The dim scream of sirens emerged from the distance. They awakened Craig to a realization that he was not yet out of danger. But it was with relief that he realized this was a tangible threat 
closing in on him. The contrast with what he had just been through was so great that he found himself discounting the danger, welcoming it. Then he realized that it was still the same threat. The watchmaker had failed in his greatest attempt. He was continuing his first plan of attack. The scream of sirens was deafening now. Craig retreated toward the back of the clothing store. As he reached the archway to the rear room, he saw two state highway cars coming from opposite directions stop out in the street, uniformed men spilling out with fat, blunt tear gas guns in their hands. He ducked quickly into the back room. Sirens screamed into the alley at either end. Craig looked around him, hoping to see a place to hide, but knowing that any place would be futile. He glanced up at the smooth ceiling. No skylights, not a chance of escape. He groaned at the inevitableness of his being caught. Suddenly, the frantic searching of his eyes discovered something he had missed before. The narrow cracks of a trapdoor in the floor. There was a ring, almost hidden under caked dirt. Visions of an unused and musty black hole of a basement made Craig hesitate. Then he dug his fingers into the dirt, holding the ring and broke it loose. As the trapdoor lifted, he saw wooden steps streaked with fungus. There was no time to test them. He went down, lowering the trapdoor over his head. Total darkness enveloped him. A second later, loud footsteps sounded on the floor above. He had been none too soon. Carefully in the darkness, he felt downward, step by step with his feet, making sure each step would hold him before putting his full weight on it. Finally, he stood on the floor. His eyes, accustomed to the darkness now, could make out faint pinpoints of light around the edges of the trapdoor. There was no other source of light, no windows, or if there were windows, they were so caked with grime that they were opaque. The atmosphere was stale and tangy with the smell of damp mold. He fought the urge to sneeze and took out his cigarette lighter. He let it burn for a brief instant while his eyes surveyed what they could see. A concrete floor, rough concrete walls, several large wooden boxes without lids, and distance that extended under the front of the store. Fixing what he had seen in his mind, he inched forward cautiously in the darkness until he had gone 10 or 15 feet. He flicked the lighter again. About to quench it, he gave a grunt of satisfaction and let it burn. He had seen what he had hoped to see, an opening in the side wall that would lead to the basement of the building next door. He went to it and looked through. He saw another basement similar to the one he was in, but here there were signs of use. A furnace that had probably been used during the winter to heat both stores, piles of cardboard boxes nested together, a swept floor, and a stairway leading up to a landing in front of a door. He closed the cigarette lighter and stood in the darkness, listening. Everything was quiet. His eyes adjusted to the darkness again. He could see light on the stair landing where it seeped past the door. Should he go up those stairs and try the door? He considered this. It was risky. The police, not finding him in the clothing store, might try neighboring ones. And anyway, the whole block was being watched. He considered contacting Carl's mind again to see what was going on there at the mine. But if they had caught Carl and put one of those hellish wristwatches on him, it could be dangerous. He flicked the lighter and glanced at his own watch. Five o'clock, two, maybe three hours until dark. Everything considered, he decided it would be better to wait at least an hour before doing anything. The police might not find the trap door. They might believe he had escaped. Business in the stores would resume its normal pace. Then it might be possible to slip away. Using his lighter once more, he fixed himself a hiding place behind some cartons and sat down. He lit a cigarette and relaxed, watching the gleaming coal at the end of the cigarette, his thoughts reviewing what had happened. The function of the little device placed in watches was now more clear. It was a punishing device, primarily. It might be a device to improve contact with or control of the mind of the wearer, but its primary function now seemed to be punishment. At least, Craig reflected, that fit the picture he was building up better. The being that had posed as a sleeping clerk was probably the mastermind, and almost certainly was not a living man. The finer matter of the Kamaloka or astral plane could be congealed into a semblance of solidity and form a materialization. But there was no evidence pointing unmistakably to dematerialization of the grosser atoms of the material plane. Still, 
the whole thing seemed to stem from Mansfield being in a mining section. Sonia was being held at a mine, for one thing. Craig's thoughts returned to the mine aspect of the problem. If a shaft had broken into some underground place, had it released long imprisoned spirits of the dead, or had it uncovered some strange machine which living persons were using? There were plenty of legends pointing to the ancients knowing the secrets of the occult. Or had there been living humans in that underground place? He considered this angle and rejected it. The food angle alone made it highly unlikely. He returned to the watchmaker, the mastermind, and that was an accurate name for him. Never had Craig Barnes encountered an enemy so quick, so multi-layered in his thinking. In his office in Chicago, he had been in contact with Theona Krupp less than five minutes when that psychic bolt of force had struck into his mind. No one could have known who he was, nor what he looked like, yet careful and elaborate plans had been made for his reception. The enemy was a master of the defense in depth, with booby traps every step of the way. Even now, being bottled up here in this basement might be another facet of the attack. Another idea jumped into Craig's line of reasoning. The only way the watchmaker had appeared to slip up was in allowing Theona to write that letter to Carl Vance. Was it possible that even that wasn't an unintentional error, but rather the first step in a deliberate plan? It was a startling thought. What would be the purpose of it? To bring him out here? That was far-fetched. But suppose it were true. Craig turned the idea this way and that. The watchmaker wouldn't have done such a thing to invite destruction of his plans, whatever his eventual plans might be. Could it be the first move in a campaign to destroy all living persons with enough ability along psychic lines to constitute a threat? A hopeless task. There were thousands. In every country in the world, there were men and women with powers so great that they could face the combined forces of Satan and come out relatively unscathed. So it couldn't be that. There remained only one other reason the watchmaker could have had deliberately to coax him out here to Mansfield, and it jibed with what had happened so far, to a certain extent. Maybe completely. If he assumed the watchmaker also had planted tests of his intelligence on the fatalistic grounds, that unless he survived those tests, he wasn't worth catching. That one reason was that the watchmaker wanted slaves with the power to help him in his scheme. It made sense. Having enslaved all of Mansfield and found his slaves practically useless to his plans, the watchmaker had tried for bigger game. An uneasy fear seeped into Craig's emotions. That psychic blast in Chicago could have been deliberately non-lethal, given only to entice him out here. The enemy might only be playing with him, waiting for the opportunity to put an enslaving wristwatch on him. If it ever got to the point where the watchmaker decided it was too much trouble to land him or too dangerous to play him anymore, he might have the ability to destroy him anytime, any place. Right now, for example, such terrible power was appalling the watchmaker might be able to materialize right here in this basement, in the darkness a few feet away. He would do so without the faintest whisper of sound, able to see with unknown senses everything here in the darkness. Such superhuman powers. Craig felt like a moronic child as he contemplated such vast potentialities. All his life, he had struggled upward alone, except for his mother, in developing his own powers. To have such an adept for a teacher, Perhaps now wasn't the time to try to defeat such an adversary. If he joined the watchmaker willingly, he would undoubtedly be very welcome. He would be taught the secrets of this vast power. To go from one place to another, he would no longer need public transportation. If he wanted to be in his office in Chicago, poof, he would be there. Wasn't that the goal of life? To develop to the fullest extent all his latent psychic powers? Of course it was, and here was his opportunity. What a fool he had been not to see it. The power it would give him. The world was threatened by another war with atom bombs that might destroy civilization. Although he had no desire for personal power, the world needed a leader capable of making sane decisions. Given the power to rule the world he could, within his lifetime, lift all humanity to the level of Western civilization. In the darkness, he considered the potentialities of the thing. The simple logic of it struck him. If it were possible for him to barge in and destroy this thing going on here in Mansfield while knowing nothing about it, 
how much easier it would be to destroy it once he was on the inside. Acquainted with every ramification of it, and with the greater psychic powers he would develop while working in. And if, which seemed more than a possibility, he lacked the ability right now to bring complete defeat to the watchmaker, wouldn't it be better to join forces with him and wait until he stood a chance? It was the only course he could take. It was the wisest course. Here was something he had spent years searching for in the laboratory, a bridge across the planes of reality that could be operated from the material plane independently of the undemonstrable processes of the human mind. Because it seemed to pose a threat to mankind or might give the watchmaker a temporary power over a few people, perhaps to their own betterment. He had rushed in like Don Quixote to topple the enemy windmills. He chuckled in good-natured tolerance of his foolish initial bravado and knight errantry. Actually, the watchmaker had been very considerate of him pinning him down while not actually hurting him in any way. The great could afford to be lenient with stupid mortals, allowing them to arrive at the correct decisions with a minimum of coaching. And in the long run, that made the stupid more willing, more loyal. With a deep sigh of contentment, Craig got to his feet. He knew what he would do now. He would march up the steps and give himself up to the police. The watchmaker would straighten everything out with the law and everything would be all right. He wasn't sure just how the boxes around him were distributed. Automatically, he took out his cigarette lighter and flicked it on. He blinked in the feeble rays from the small flame, peering into the gloom at the dancing shadows, and saw the watchmaker. Hello, the watchmaker said. Craig was fascinated by the movements of the man's lips the slow, perfect enunciation of the one word. A tremendous wave of goodwill and friendliness came at him from the man. Allow me to introduce myself, the man continued. I'm Gustavus Altschuler. Hello, Craig said. I'm Craig Barnes. I have been standing here in the dark, listening to your thoughts, Altschuler said, his voice rich and deep, with a suggestion of tolerant good nature. He chuckled. Very good thoughts, too. I like a man who jumps in, then stand still in the excitement long enough to think things through. We'll get along together, all right. Altschuler fixed his eyes on Craig's wristwatch. Craig looked down at it, and without being aware that anything had changed, he glanced down at his lighter, still burning. He stared at it vaguely, then, oh, he said, I must be getting absent-minded. He took out a cigarette and flicked the lighter on again and lit the cigarette. Inhaling deeply, he looked around at the display of clocks hanging on the walls of the shop, at the large board behind Altschuler, filled with wristwatches with tags on them. Obviously watches left to be repaired. That reminds me, he said. I was passing by and noticed your shop. My watch has been losing time. Would you adjust it for me? Of course, Mr. Barnes, the watchmaker said. He reached over the counter. His deft fingers slipped under the band and withdrew the watch from Craig's wrist. He took the watch to his workbench and took a glass from his vest pocket and cupped it in his eye. Then he took a thin blade and pried the case apart. He took out the works and looked at them through the magnifying glass. Carefully, he made an adjustment. Then he opened a drawer under the bench. Idle curiosity caused Craig to glance down at the drawer. In it was a pile of small metallic shapes too fine for his eyes to make out in detail. He saw Altschuler daintily pick one up with a pair of tweezers and start to insert it in the works of the watch. Abruptly full realization of what was happening hit Craig. This was what Theona Krupp had described in detail, even the mental part. A second ago, he had had a vague feeling of having passed the shop and dropped in. By a supreme effort, he let none of his awakening show in his expression. He let his eyes rove idly about the shop, wondering if he were still in that basement, or whether by some strange power he had been transported to the watchmaker's shop between the supermarket and the drugstore. He tried to pin down in his mind when the transition from basement gloom to store brightness had taken place. He knew now that his cigarette lighter had been burning for a far different reason than absent-mindedness. The whole thing was so subtle, so smoothly inserted in his mind. It could have happened a dozen different ways. He could have been blanked out and led up out of the basement and around to this shop. 
then snapped out of the hypnotic trance with a post-hypnotic command that would take care of the transition and jump. Or he could still be in that basement. If he tried to attack the watchmaker, the whole shop might vanish and be replaced by the basement again. There you are, Altschuler said, snapping the case together and extending the watch. Craig hastily reached into his pocket and brought out his wallet, holding it in both hands. Fine, he said heartily. How much do I owe you? Altschuler still held out the wristwatch. His dark eyes looked keenly at Craig, then down at the wallet. There will be no charge, he said. Oh, come now, Craig said. You can't make a living that way. I'll tell you what. I'm going to be in Mansfield for a few days. My watch needs cleaning, so I think I'll leave it with you. Clean it up for me. That's probably why it was losing time anyway. Dirt. He put his wallet back in his pocket with an air of carelessness and took a step toward the street door. He smiled at Altschuler. I'll drop in the end of the week for it, he said. There was a baffled light in Gustavus Altschuler's dark eyes as Craig opened the door. And the solidity of the door gave Craig a thrill. It felt solid. He stepped out onto the sidewalk. The familiar supermarket was a few feet away. There were no police cars in evidence. Craig dared to look back at the watchmaker's shop. He saw Altschuler still standing there, holding the wristwatch, looking at him through the window, the baffled light still in his eyes. Craig waved a cheery goodbye and walked away. He was trembling so much he felt he would sink to the sidewalk with every step. It was an emotional reaction. Inside, he was almost hysterical with exultation. Once more, he had beaten the watchmaker. He wanted to throw back his head and laugh unrestrainedly. He wanted to tell the passers-by what he had done. He wanted to run as though the hounds of hell were after him and hide in some hidden cave. He was afraid, more afraid than he had ever been in his life. That realization sobered him slowly. He had to get hold of himself and not panic. Automatically, he glanced at his wrist. His watch was not there, and it was the most wonderful thing in the world for it not to be. He began to walk faster. As he neared the edge of town, he broke into a slow, space-eating trot, every sense alert for the first sign of danger. It might come from anywhere, a police car, a pedestrian, even a passenger car might veer toward him without warning. He sensed that he had dealt Gustavus Altschuler a devastating blow. When the man recovered, he would realize that he had to destroy him, and quickly. Before he had gone a quarter of a mile, he decided to leave the highway and cut across the fields. Besides cutting down the danger of unexpected attack, it would save him a mile or so of distance. He cut diagonally across a wheat field. The stubble quickly cut into the soft leather of his shoes, but he kept on, trying to keep up his pace. He came to a graded dirt road that went in the right direction and decided to give up the fields. He was panting from the exertion, but after a quarter of a mile along the road, he got his second wind. His panic was completely gone now. He wanted to stop and think out what had happened. He felt sure he knew exactly what he was up against now and what he must do about it. The trouble was he realized that he might be wrong and he wouldn't get a second chance. He was free now only because he had been grossly underestimated. He reached a rise in the road which enabled him to see the highway a half mile away. Even as he glanced that way, he saw police cars speeding toward Mansfield. If he had continued on the highway, he would have been caught. He came to the top of the rise. More farms stretched out ahead of him. Beyond them were the rolling hills covered with forests. He stopped. Shading his eyes from the sun low on the horizon, he studied the landscape in the direction of the mine. Finally, he made out the sloping roof of the ore processing plant nested against the side of the mountain. It wasn't more than a mile and a half away in a straight line. For several minutes, he studied the farmland between him and the mine, memorizing it. Then he left the road and went to a small cluster of three-year-old pines. Far enough in so that he could not be seen, he lay down. Less than 10 minutes later, a police car sped by on the road, silent and swift. Craig grinned at it from the concealment of his hiding place. He had taken to cover just in time. A few minutes later, the bloated red sun touched the horizon. 
it would be gone before the search could settle down to a systematic covering of every clump of brush and every cluster of trees. The darkness would be in his favor, not theirs. Inch by inch the sun set until it was gone. For a little while, the illusion of growing brightness and dimming visibility, that is the twilight of the northern United States, remained. Then the shadows of night grew strong. One star after another winked into existence. A thin crescent moon hung at an unnatural angle high in the eastern sky. Far away a dog howled mournfully, as though sensing that this night might bring death. Craig stirred himself and stood up, stretching to loosen his muscles that had become stiff with inaction. He left the thicket and stood in the wheat stubble, looking along the road. Back toward town, he saw lights of a car that moved slowly. From time to time, a spotlight briefly surveying a cluster of trees or a clump of bushes. The systematic search had begun, and he had no doubt that if he were illuminated by the spotlight, he would meet with a hail of bullets. There were only two possible futures ahead of him now, victory or death. Ignoring the police car, which was still a half a mile away, he looked up into the sky, locating the North Star. From it, he turned his eyes until he had picked out another star in the direction of the mine. It would move with the passage of time, but it would do as a guide. He remembered suddenly Carl's request for him to bring back some sandwiches and smiled in the darkness. The memory made him realize he was both hungry and thirsty. He reached down and broke off a straw and put it in his mouth. As it grew wet, it tasted slightly sweet and rather pleasant. He began walking through the wheat stubble, keeping his eyes on the star so he would keep a straight line. He wanted to reach his goal on the button and not have to blunder around in the darkness searching for it. Not only did his life depend on it, perhaps the future of the human race depended on it. If he didn't destroy the monstrous thing he had uncovered, it would grow too big for any man to stop. He reached a barbed wire fence and climbed over it. Making sure of his direction again, he kept on. He climbed over three more fences before he changed direction. Now he had the dark outlines of buildings to guide him. Although the buildings were merely vague blobs, he knew the major details of each. He had seen them before, at close quarters. There was a huge structure with steeply sloping roof. There were other and smaller structures. He stole silently toward one of these. As he drew nearer, he made out faint cracks of light. The interior was well lighted with tightly drawn shades. He circled the building without finding any place where he could peek inside. At the foot of the steps, he hesitated, then cautiously tried the first step. Voices erupted from inside, too muffled for words to be made out. Then suddenly, they haven't located him yet, in a woman's voice. The rumble of a man's voice answered her. In the darkness, a grin flickered over Craig's lips as he took the second step. Any doubts he had had were now gone. He knew every facet of the mystery. It had been there from the very beginning, if he had only had sense enough to see it. He took another step, then felt forward with his foot, encountering only smooth extent. He was on the porch. With infinite caution, he slid his feet forward, step after step, until his groping hands touched the wall. He explored with his fingertips until he found the frame of the door. He groped downward with light touch until he came in contact with the knob. Was the door locked? He didn't dare try it to find out. He would have to hit it with enough force to open it if it were locked and be ready to pull himself up short if it weren't. Or he would find himself sprawling into the room off balance. He had to have an instant of surprise in his favor. The freedom of the world depended upon it. With his hand on the doorknob, he drew back and bunched his shoulder. Throwing every ounce of physical strength he possessed into the one convulsive movement, he hit the door, twisting the knob at the last instant. The splintering of wood was a deafening sound. Craig landed on his feet, his eyes trying to adjust to the bright light. Two figures moved, blobs of color in his eyes. A scream came from one of them. He leaped toward it as his eyes came into clearer focus. He lashed out with his fist and felt it encounter something hard. He whirled. The man was staring at him with wide eyes, still paralyzed by surprise. Without a pause, Craig darted in and seized the man's hand, clawing at the wristwatch. The man screamed just as the wristwatch came free. 
Craig felt a numbing shock constrict his fingers and paralyze his arm. He was thrown backward by the constriction of his own muscles. The force ceased abruptly. The watch had fallen from his hand to the floor. He shook his arm in a frantic effort to get it to working again. With a bellow of fear and rage, the man charged at him, fists flailing. Craig sidestepped, letting the man lurch past him. He worked at his arm some more during the precious seconds he had gained. It remained partially numbed and useless. The man charged again. Craig didn't get out of the way in time. A heavy fist struck him in the mouth and sent him backward, bringing up against the wall. The man followed, reaching Craig with several long punches that had lost their main force. The element of surprise was no longer in Craig's favor. He sidestepped and got away from the wall. He weaved and danced just beyond reach of the man, darting in for quick jabs. He was beginning to sense that he might lose this fist fight. The terrible cost if he did lose it, it made him desperate. With a wild lunge, he got in past the man's guard. Then he went berserk, his fists working like pistons. The man stood up under the blows stubbornly. Sobbing his despair, Craig backstepped out of range. Suddenly, the man dropped his fists. All right, he said, you don't have to hit me anymore. I'm myself now, for the first time in a long time. Thanks, Craig gasped. He turned from the man and bent down beside the woman. He touched her face. She moaned weakly and moved. With swift desperation, Craig hit her just under the ear. Her head jerked and she became limp again. He straightened up and looked at the man. The man looked from Craig to the woman, his eyes mirroring fear. There's some sleeping pills she used to make me take, he said. Get them, Craig said. The man left the room. In a moment, he returned with a small pill box. He handed it to Craig. Craig opened it and recognized the drug from the capsules. Ignoring the man, he bent down beside the woman and pushed a capsule into her mouth, well back. When he squeezed her mouth closed, she gulped convulsively, swallowing the capsule. He repeated the performance several times until he had given her almost a lethal dose, enough to keep her unconscious for at least 12 hours. He straightened. Where's my secretary, Sonia Mills, he demanded. She's down in the cave, the man said. That other feller is down there with her. They caught him skulking out in the woods near the ore plant. Can we get down into the cave from here? Craig asked. Yes, sure. The man went to the woman and bent down, taking a keychain from her dress pocket. What's the matter with mommy? Craig whirled in the direction of the voice. A little girl was standing in an open doorway, her eyes swollen with sleep. Mommy's asleep, Pat, the man said patiently. You go back to bed. I have to go out with this man. The innocent little face turned toward Craig. Then the little girl's eyes turned toward the splintered door. What's the matter with the door, Daddy, she asked. It got broke, honey. Now you go back to bed. You should be asleep. I was. The little girl smiled very gravely at Craig and went back into the bedroom, closing the door. The man looked at Craig without expression. I'll get a flashlight, he said. It's in the pantry. He disappeared through another door, returning a moment later with a five-cell flashlight. Craig followed the man outside. Less than a quarter of a mile away was the headlights of a car, and a spotlight cutting a wide path over the wheat field. The man turned on the flashlight. The next moment, the spotlight on the car went out and the headlights began moving swiftly toward them. Turn out the light, Craig said, and move fast. That's the police and they're after me. I can well imagine, the man said, shutting off the flashlight. I'm doing this for all of them. He trotted ahead in the darkness with Craig right behind him. He stopped at a small building, the sound of metal grating against metal became lost in the louder sound of the police car turning off the road into the driveway. The door swung open. Craig followed the man into the interior darkness without hesitation. Close the door, the man said. When it was closed, he turned on the flashlight and reached past Craig to slide a heavy bolt in place in the door. Craig's eyes were wide with surprise at what the flashlight revealed. Almost the entire floor was the floor of an elevator. In the rafters of the building were large drums with cables attached to the top of the elevator frame. The door they had just entered through rattled violently. Open up in there or we'll shoot, a loud voice demanded. That's Murch, Craig's companion said. Get on, he's likely to shoot. Craig stepped onto the elevator. 
His companion pushed the control lever over to full speed, and the elevator dropped so swiftly that Craig gasped in alarm. Seconds later, it slowed abruptly to a stop, level with a rough passageway shored up with heavy timbers. The two men stooped and went into the passageway. It went straight for over a hundred yards, then ended at a rough archway cut in solid stone. They stepped into a high arched tunnel whose walls were smooth and without cracks, and whose floor had shallow grooves an inch apart running parallel with the walls. This is the original tunnel, Craig's companion explained. It ends back that way with a cave-in about 200 yards. The big room with the machine is up ahead. They came to a steel wall barring the way. There was a small door in it. The man unlocked the padlock with one of the keys on the ring. He was taking the padlock out of the staple when he jerked suddenly. The next instant, a deafening explosion sounded. As Craig caught his slumping companion, a sound like a hammer blow erupted from the door. Another explosion came from down the tunnel. That damn merch, the wounded man grunted. Get through that door and leave me here before you get shot. He meant to hit you, not me. Craig recognized the sense of that, but he hesitated. How do you shut off the machine, he asked. Another bullet splattered against the door so close to him that he could feel its heat. I don't know, the man groaned. Craig pushed open the door and leaped inside. He groaned as he realized he had forgotten the flashlight. He had to have it. Dropping prone, he inched out until he could reach it and shut it off. He pulled back through the doorway and slammed the heavy metal door shut. When he turned on the flashlight again, he saw the heavy sliding bar that would lock the door from this side so that nothing could break it down. He regretted not bringing the wounded man in with him. He knew, though, that he had been right. The police were his friends and would get him to a doctor quickly if he needed it. He turned his back to the door and directed the flashlight beam ahead of him. The passageway continued on as far as the light penetrated. He took time now to examine the walls of the tunnel. They seemed to be of fine granite. The dimensions of the tunnel were so uniform that it didn't seem possible human hands could have shaped it. How many centuries ago had it been carved? 10,000 years more, perhaps, during the peak of a prehistoric civilization far in advance of the present one. Or were some of the legends and tales of ancient cultures built by creatures from out of space true? There might never be an answer. Craig hurried forward along the tunnel. It seemed to widen far ahead. He tried to keep track of distance and soon guessed he must be under the hill where the ore processing shed was. At last, he reached the end of the tunnel and stepped out into a large space with the roof broken up into small domes supported at their common lower points by pillars six feet thick. He stood still, playing the flashlight beam past the rows of pillars in search of something that would seem to be the unknown machine. What would it look like? He couldn't think of anything. It might not even look like a machine. Finally, he shut off the flashlight and stood in the darkness, letting his eyes adjust. And presently through the darkness, he saw a faint bluish glow. He realized at once that it wasn't light. It was astral light similar to the human aura. No spectroscope or camera would have registered a thing. He went forward in the darkness, holding out his hand to keep from bumping into a pillar. He didn't stop until he was less than 10 feet from the pulsing blue aura. Every cell of his body tingled with exhilaration as though intoxicated. There was psychic force here greater than anything conceivable, and it was independent of any living or sentient entity. He hesitated about turning on the light, trying to visualize from the shape of the aura what the machine itself would look like. It was quite large, standing about 10 feet high and perhaps six by eight feet on its base. It seemed more to be a huge block of solid stuff than a machine made of parts. But that might not be so. The human aura didn't follow the human shape. So the machine might be almost any shape. Craig didn't waste time on further speculation. He turned on the flashlight, what the light revealed was disappointing. A rod of metal roughened by oxidation, a dull gray color, rose from the stone floor. The rod was about four inches in diameter and four feet high. He would have passed it by if he hadn't seen its aura in total darkness. He walked around the rod, searching for some small detail that would indicate structure or controls. There was nothing, yet he was certain this was the machine. 
He reached out to touch it, but drew back his hand. The rod might be radioactive, almost certainly was for the machine still to have power after so many centuries. He drew away from it with new caution. He circled it slowly at a distance of five feet without finding anything pointing to the nature of the machine. How did it function? He thought of the principles of high-frequency radio waves. With them, the shape and size of the broadcasting antenna was very important. But from radio theory, the natural frequency of this rod would be in the longer infrared band, and certainly not in anything that would indicate something mental. Of course, he exclaimed aloud at a sudden inspiration. The rod is only the material anchor of the machine itself, and the machine is in the Kama Loka, the astral plane. Craig went over to one of the thick pillars of stone and sat down with his back against it. He shut off the flashlight and laid it down beside him on the floor. He closed his eyes. He was suddenly tired, exhausted. He hadn't had any rest for so many hours that he couldn't remember when he had felt fresh. It would be so nice to just sleep a natural sleep and forget everything. The machine could wait. He was safe here anyway. He had the keys and the door was barred from inside. And anyway, the machine shouldn't be shut off. It was such a wonderful instrument, a bridge between two universal planes of reality, a bridge uniting two universes into one. It could make gods out of mortals. Look what it had done to Gus Altschuler. Craig's lips parted in a smile of confidence. He knew his thoughts were hypnotically induced by Altschuler. The man was somewhere in this underground cavern, or at least his astral body was here. He wanted to lull Craig until he could get here in the flesh and deal with him. Kill him. But Gus wouldn't kill him. Not good old Gus. He wanted him to be his partner. Together, they could present this machine from a lost era to the world. It would advance civilization a million years overnight. Gus walked out of the shadows and stood over him. He no longer seemed a mere mortal. His aura was laced with white and silver and gold and subtle variations of purest blue. Only a true god could possess an aura so beautiful. Come, my child, Gus said with godlike dignity. Stand up beside me at my right hand. You shall be my son. Craig smiled. It was the final booby trap of the mastermind. If he disassociated himself from his physical body for even an instant, Gustavus Altschuler would unleash the full force of the machine and destroy his soul. But if he stayed within the protection of knit matter behind his unbroken astral shell of protection, he could never shut off the machine. He looked up at the god who invited him to join him, be his son. It seemed impossible that such a god could harbor an evil or treacherous thought. It was his own evil and suspicious soul that dreamed up such absurd thoughts. He wasn't worthy of becoming full partner of such a god. A god himself. Craig felt the tingling separation of spirit and body begin with his lower extremities and creep upward toward his hips. Ahead of him lay destruction of his soul. No, ahead of him lay the power and peace of true Godhead, backed by the infinite power of the bridge that linked two universes and made them one. Gustavus Altschuler extended a hand to help him rise. Gus the Watchmaker. Craig smiled slowly. He felt the disassociation of his astral body become complete but he continued to lie within his physical frame as though still tied to it. He looked past Gus at the machine. He could see it now in all its intricate details and studied it in search of the controls. The astral projection of the watchmaker was solid to him now, and he was ready. He leaped to his feet and lashed out at Altschuler, knowing that he could not hurt him, but only knock him temporarily out of coordination. In a straight battle, he could hope for nothing but stalemate. But one thing was in his favor. Gus had swung from the one extreme of underestimating him to the other extreme of overestimating his powers. Gus was afraid of him. Gus was basically a coward. He projected that thought at the godlike figure with its beautiful and fantastic aura. The figure drew back and wavered. In that instant, Craig darted around Gus to the machine. There were several control buttons, each with a strange symbol under it. He would have to guess which control shut the machine off. Six control buttons, one chance out of six for mankind, or two chances before Gus rallied. Viciously, Craig jabbed down on a button. The almost inaudible hum within the machine grew higher in tone. Once more, Craig jabbed at a button. In the same instant, he felt himself lifted by a terrible force and thrown across the cavern. 
But even as he felt himself hurtling toward destruction, he sensed that the machine was off. He had shut it off. Craig and Sonia and Carl stood outside the airport depot, watching the plane circling in for a landing. Their bags were on a cart just outside the fence. They would be the only passengers boarding the Chicago plane from Billings. With the bags they had brought from Chicago was a small wooden box. In it was the metal rod that had anchored the machine to the material plane. The rod was cut up into small sections. Well, Craig said, I'm glad that's over. He turned to Carl with a broad grin. And don't you dare show me another letter from your readers for at least a month. I want to rest up. Besides, if you showed up with another letter during the next month or two, I would be too busy to see you. I'm going to study the alloy of that rod. He turned his grin on Sonia. What's eating you, he said. You look as mad as a wet hen. You've been that way ever since I rescued you from that room in the ore house. Certainly I'm mad, Sonia said. When we get to Chicago, I'm quitting my job. Why, Craig asked, a twinkle in his eyes. Why did you have to let us stay locked up without food or water for almost 24 hours after you could have rescued us? I'll tell you why. You went to sleep. I know you were tired, but why couldn't you have rescued us first and then slept in a nice, comfortable bed? I'm sorry, Craig said contritely. If you'll stay on the job, I promise never to do that again, he chuckled. But that isn't all, Sonia went on inexorably. I came out here to help you solve a mystery. What happened? Nothing. That's what happened. Nothing. I sat in a boardroom with nothing but mice for company the whole time. You were lucky, Craig said. I would have traded places with you. Carl chuckled. Can the act, Sonia? You know you wouldn't quit your job for anything. You were just unlucky this time. Maybe next time you'll be captured by a fiend who likes to torture women. That isn't what I mean, Sonia said, half angrily. And another thing, how did you know that Theana Krupp was the real power behind things? I didn't at first, Craig said soberly. Things just began to add up. They don't all add up even yet, but they never do in psychic phenomena. I should have guessed from the start, though. The jolt I got when I tried to contact her by the psychic emanations from her letter. It wasn't anywhere near a full blast. She could have killed me if she wanted to. But she was in love with me. Carl and Sonia both gasped. How do you figure that? Carl said. Let's do a bit of reconstructing the way I see things, Craig said. Gus Altschuler owned that mine. It had been shut down for several years because the mine wasn't paying, but he dreamed of finding another paying vein. He had his watchmaker's shop, and on weekends he would go out and do a little mining on his own. He broke through into this ancient tunnel. It didn't seem anything but an old tunnel to him, maybe a natural formation. He didn't know much about formations. Then, he and Theona fell for each other and used to meet secretly at the mine. He didn't know she was psychic. One day he showed her his tunnel. She saw the aura of the machine and got excited about it. While Gus watched over her, she went into a trance and left her body and learned how to turn the thing on. When it was turned on, it was easy for her to find the store of those little pilot sets sealed up in that metal box she showed us after it was all over. And it didn't take much experimenting for her and Gus to find out their purpose. Some of them were control units. Others were receivers. She and Gus wore the remote control units and Gus inserted the receivers in the watches. The real power was in that machine. It obeyed Theona's every wish with an exactness that must have come from centuries of scientific perfection. She saw a way to expand her power until she ruled the whole world with that machine. Gus thought he was her partner in it, but he was just a pawn in her larger scheme. She planned to get rid of him eventually anyway. But then she got to reading about my investigations of things as written by our friend Carl, who likes to build me up big to make things interesting for the readers of his articles. And she undoubtedly saw my picture in a magazine. She decided I was the one to rule the world with her. But even with me, she wanted to have the upper hand. She was in love with me, though. When did you decide that, Mastermind? Sonia said. When Gus had me completely in his power and suddenly couldn't do anything about it. I was in his shop. He had put the receiver gadget in my watch. All he had to do was put the watch on my wrist. 
I couldn't have prevented it, and suddenly I was able to stall him off and walk out of his shop. It was then that everything clicked into place. The only thing that could account for my being given my temporary freedom was someone weakening. There was no reason for that unless Theona were more than a slave and were in love with me. Up until that moment, I had believed what she implied in her letter, that she was an unwitting victim. That, of course, was a factual description of what the real victims, the townspeople, went through. That machine could plant any kind of illusion in a person's head. So, Carl said, it was love that tripped up Theona. Partly, Craig said. He lit a cigarette and watched the plane coming in for a landing. It was mostly something more basic than love. Conscience. Did you ever notice how many criminals behave with utter stupidity when they are just on the point of getting away with their crimes? Look at the Robert Hall kidnapping case. The kidnapper got away with it. He had the $600,000. All he had to do was sit back and use a little common sense. Instead, he carted the money around with him in taxis and parked it in hotel rooms. He showed it to people he didn't know. He practically forced people to turn him in. His conscience demanded that he pay for his crime. Look at the Shuchi murders in Chicago last fall. He intended to make the deaths all look like deaths from burning. But he put a pillow over the head of one child and wrapped a nightie around the head of another. He left the gun on the scene. He told his girlfriend, in effect, that he was going to commit the murders before he did it. While he planned and executed the murders, his conscience was carefully planning to bring him to justice and punishment. I think the same basic dualism of purpose worked in Theona. While she dreamed of ruling the world with me beside her, the very fact that she felt the need of a recognized adept showed her recognition that she would be miserable ruling the world alone. In fact, she didn't want to rule it at all. She wanted to belong to the man whom she had chosen to rule it. And under that was the subconscious realization that it was wrong and she should be stopped. The part of her mind that knew she should be stopped was always working against her. Craig dropped his cigarette and ground it out with his shoe. He looked at Sonia and sighed deeply. In a way, he said sadly, I'm sorry it turned out the way it did. When she gets out of the state hospital, for the insane poor Ted will take her back again and care for her. But basically, she has the potentialities for greatness. True greatness. It's too bad that she didn't meet someone who really understood her when she was younger. Someone able to keep her in line and down to earth. A manager as well as a lover and husband. Or maybe I'm just feeling sorry for Ted. He's a fine man and deserves something better in life than unhappiness. Sometimes I wish I could reach into the lives of such people and straighten them out, make them happy. You too? Sonia said with mocking softness that tried unsuccessfully not to reveal sympathetic understanding. Even me, Craig said stubbornly. At times I suppose every man wishes he could rule the world for its own good. You know, Carl Vance said, that's an interesting thought. Now that I think of it, maybe even Hitler's guilt complexes worked toward his ruin. Some of his actions and decisions make sense in that light. He stared at the passengers getting off the plane and coming toward them. Suddenly he shuddered. What's the matter, Carl? Cold, Sonia said. No. I'm just beginning to realize that if I ever go crooked, the person I'm going to have to be most afraid of is myself. I wonder what became of the watchmaker? Craig said absently. The police said he skipped out. Probably it was just as well he did. He lifted his arm and glanced at his wrist. Oh, good Lord, he exclaimed. My watch, I forgot to get it. 